Sam, thanks for that song. That was beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For the next few minutes, I'd like us all to try to think non-anthropocentrically. To think anthropocentrically is to think as we habitually do from our customary perspective as human beings. But to think non-anthropocentrically is to imagine the world from, uh, not from our perspective, or even from the perspective of other people, but from the perspectives of other beings with whom we share this planet. I'm inviting you, in other words, to try to see with other eyes, hear with other ears, or realize that some of our fellow creatures encounter the world in ways that we can't even imagine. Let's start with bears. <laughs> Here's a quote from John Muir, the great American environmentalist whose activism sparked the creation of our national parks. He was a master at thinking non-anthropocentrically. This is what he says about bears. Bears are made of the same dust as we, and they breathe the same winds and drink of the same waters. A bear's days are warmed by the same sun. His dwellings are overdomed by the same blue sky, and his life turns and ebbs with heart pulsing like ours. He, evidently all 19th century bears were male, <laughs> was poured from the same first fountain. And whether he at last goes to our stingy heaven or not, he has terrestrial immortality. His life, not long, not short, knows no beginning or ending. To him, life unstinted, unplanned, is above the accidents of time, and his years, markless and boundless, equal eternity. Okay, well, that's enough about bears in the 19th century. Now let's widen the time horizon. Our planet is very old, and on it there have been many good times and many bad times. There were times when Earth was richly inhabited, times when it was barren, times when it was molten hot, and times when it was bitterly cold, times when life was ascendant for tens of millions of years, and times of mass extinction. <clears throat> to everything there is a season, but some seasons have been better than others. I don't mean better for us. Humans weren't around for most of this. Leave us and our preferences and predilections out of it. That's what it means to think non-anthropocentrically. I'm talking of times when there was much that was good and much that was bad without any humans being there at all. The times following the Chicxulub of asteroid slight strike about 66 million years ago, for example, were very bad. The impact of that six mile wide rock and its consequences, enormous tsunamis, worldwide wild, wildfires, and the disruptions of global climate, eliminated three quarters of all species. All the dinosaurs died, except for a few of those that had already evolved into birds. <laughs> Suffering, starvation, injury, and death were terrible beyond comprehension. Eventually, life recovered, but it took tens of millions of years. The times since then have, by comparison, been relatively good, a kind of Garden of Eden. Biodiversity has blossomed. Innumerable beings in fantastic variety have arisen, flourished, and reproduced. Some felt pain or joy or something analogous to them long before humans did. Our species arrived on the scene just a few hundred thousand years ago, just at the moment of greatest biodiversity ever. But let's go back even further. There were good times and bad times even before the last asteroid strike. Far back into the past, perhaps nearly four billion years. Beyond that, 
we come to a time with no life at all. When Earth was a molten rock, even at the surface, or when it was mostly a lifeless ocean with a poisonous atmosphere, there was no good or bad for anything. Nor was there good or bad in cold space or in the furnaces of the sun or on the dusty moon or anywhere in the universe that we know about. No living or dying, no trouble or rest, no striving or failure, nothing good or bad. For there to be harm or benefit, there has to be something capable of harm or benefit. Rocks or dust or lava or gases can't be benefited or harmed. There can be good times or bad times only when there is life. So when we think non-anthropocentrically about good and bad, as we are thinking, we are automatically thinking about life itself. And to love non-anthropocentrically, as John Muir did, is to love life, all of it, including the least of creatures, and not excluding us. It is not then merely a negative ideal, the opposite of anthropocentric love. It is to love positively, biocentrically, that is life-centeredly, which is a positive ideal. It is to see that there is good and bad, not just for us, but for everything that lives. It is to see that both good times and bad extend far beyond us, but it's also to see that in the vast spans of time and space, they are exceptional and extraordinarily rare. So what? Why should we think, perhaps even love, biocentrically? One answer is that we live in a time of little hope. Biologists now worry that we may, by recreating the world to suit ourselves, be bringing on another bad time of very long duration. They don't put it that way. They talk of biodiversity loss, threats to species, diminishment of ecosystem services, habitat destruction, and lately, and ever more frequently, of a sixth mass extinction. That asteroid strike 66 million years ago was the fifth. A mass extinction is a very bad time, by definition a time when most, maybe three-quarters of the species on Earth are lost. Biologists now worry that, given how powerful our species have become, our thinking, perhaps even our loving, is far too narrow. If we think only anthropocentrically, then we are like the egoist, the person who cares about nothing for him or herself. I'll, he, I'll call him he, you can substitute your favorite <laughs> gender pronoun. may be happy while he has power and time, but he has a problem. When he notices the inevitable approach of his death, he sees that everything that matters to him, everything he considers good, ends there. He faces, if he is honest with himself, ultimate despair or he hides in cowardly denial. Either way, he has no sustainable long-term source of hope. But what if he loves? To love someone is to care not just for your good, but also for theirs. That's what it means to be self-transcendent. If you love others, you can sustain hope for them even when you have no hope for yourself. The more you love, the more you can hope, and the less tragic your impending death seems by comparison. In ecology, there's a principle that larger and more bio, the more the larger and more biodiverse a living community is, the more sustainable it is. In human psychology, there seems to be an analogous principle. The larger and more deserve, diverse our self-transcendence is, the more sustainable is our hope. We need not 
like the egoist, despair even in the face of death. To be self-transcendent is to see one's own life in others, not, or not to think much of the difference. It is to care for children or one's parents or friends or companion animals or the birds in the backyard or the forests of the Great Smoky Mountains. It is to find one's life also in theirs. One of the great contemporary authors of our southern Appalachian bioregion is Barbara Kingsolver. She describes the experience of biocentric self-transcendence this way. I've been shattered and reassembled a few times over. And there have been long days when I felt my heart was simply somewhere else, possibly on ice. So what, life asked and went on whirling recklessly around me. Always, every minute, something is eaten or being eaten, laying eggs, burrowing in the mud, blooming, splitting its seeds, dividing itself into two. What a messy marvel, fecundity. Be still. The world is bound to turn itself inside out. Everywhere you look, Joyful noise is clanging to drown out quiet desperation. The choice is draw the blinds and shut it out or believe. We do live in a time of little hope. We may, in fact, be bringing on this ex mass extinction. Talk about desperation. Isn't everything threatened? What if we extinguish life itself? What if we destroy the planet? <clears throat> Let's not be melodramatic. <laughs> the planet is a spherical rock, 8,000 miles in diameter. Nobody's gonna destroy that. Death stars exist only in Star Wars movies. <laughs> <laughs> but what about life? Nobody's going to destroy that either. We don't have and are never likely to get the power to sterilize the planet. Some living things will survive no matter what we do. Life has flourished here for nearly 4 billion years and has survived in deep, hot hydrothermal vents in the oceans under, or, and under kilometers of ice. It has survived periods of warming more intense than we are ever likely to produce. And it has survived planet-wide deep freezes. It has survived radical alterations in the composition of the atmosphere. It has survived and recovered from at least five mass extinctions. Its tenacity is mind-boggling. We can and very well might precipitate another mass extinction, but that's probably the worst we can do. 